from The Advocate magazine in partnership with Glad. This is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and last week we heard from the author Sarah Shulman talking about ACT UP and the history of HIV AIDS activism in the US. And this week I wanted to expand that conversation and shift it south, where, as we've talked about, the South makes up the bulk of new HIV infections in the US. To talk about it all, Gina Brown is here. Gina has been working in the field of HIV for almost 20 years and now works at the Southern AIDS Coalition, doing community organizing and engagement. When it comes to HIV, women, women of color, women living with HIV are so often left out of the conversation. And so I'm really excited for Gina to be joining us today. Let's hear it. I want to jump right in. So you found out that you were living with HIV about 27 years ago. And at that time, how much did you know about or how familiar were you with HIV? My knowledge of HIV was gay white guys. I remember watching the, the evening news and I'm talking about it even before they had a name for it. And they were calling it grid and gay plague. And, but it only impacted gay people, right? So if you weren't gay, you were, okay, I'm good. Or, or even if, if you were a lesbian, they weren't talking about HIV and lesbians. They were talking about HIV and gay men. So you still felt like you were good. No one was talking about it with women. I only knew what I saw on the evening news. I remember once watching the guys go up to Capitol Hill and they were on stretchers and in wheelchairs and on walkers. I was so scared. And they had a sign, and the sign said, silence equals death. And that just stayed with me all those years. Do you mind telling the story of when you were told about your diagnosis? Because I think it's an amazing example of what not to do. Oh, my goodness. That day is seared in my mind. I think if I got Alzheimer's, I would still remember that day. First, I got the phone call, the initial phone call on April Fool's Day, April 1st. And when I answered the phone, the lady said, may I speak with Gina Brown? I said, speaking. And then she said, hey, this is Miss So-and-so from Charity Hospital. And I laughed. And I laughed because it was April Fool's Day and I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke. This lady, she finally convinced me that she was really from the hospital. And she said, we need you to come in. We need to talk to you about one of your test results. And I said, okay. And... And when I went, the door was open. So I just stuck my hand in and tapped on the door. And um, she said, come in. And when she said, come in, she never looked up. She never looked up. And then finally, she took papers and she put them in front of her face. And she said, well, you have AIDS and you're going to die. It wasn't you have AIDS and because of AIDS, you may die. It was you have AIDS and you're going to die. And I collapsed in a chair. She was a a, a nurse, she was a provider. If a medical person tells you that you have a fatal disease, you're going to believe them, especially if, you're, if you're, your health literacy is, is low. You know, I only went to the doctor when I was sick. I wasn't going for checkups, you know, none of that stuff. I mean, I didn't have insurance. So when I got sick, I went to charity hospital. I think that you bring up a great point because I mean, that story is like shocking for a number of reasons, but I think that we just assume that nurses and medical professionals would know better when in fact they're also humans who are susceptible to stigmas. Yes, and she was. But she did one thing right that day because after I stopped crying, I told her, I said, okay. She said, okay, what? I said, okay, I can go home and kill myself. I mean, you just told me I was going to die. In my mind, I remember seeing those guys going up to Capitol Hill and I remember how they looked. Everybody's going to know. So I'd rather kill myself now while I look like this before I look like that. And that was my thinking. And she said, if you leave here, I'm going to call your mama. People think that it's like a myth in the black community. It's not. <laughs> you can be 80 years old. If your mama is still alive, she can <laughs> she still have control over you. Like, <laughs> So when she said that, I kind of. Not changed my mind, but decided that I'm not going to tell her that I'm going to do this, you know, just leave and do it. And she said, I have someone I want you to talk to. And this lady comes into the room and I'm sitting and she and I are about the same height. She may be a little taller than me sitting. And the first thing she did was grab my hand and I snatched away because, I mean, this lady over here just told me I have AIDS. So 
Why would you want to touch me? I, I didn't know how you contract HIV. I really didn't. And she kept trying to touch my hand. And then finally she said, why are you pulling away? And I said, because I have AIDS. And she said, who, t- <laughs> who told you you have AIDS? And I was like a first grader. I pointed at the other nurse and I said her. But in, her, in meeting this woman, this woman told me if I did three things, I could live. On the same day, I was told I was going to die. And when she said it, I think if I was a dog, my ears would have perked up. Because as she started talking, I remember leaning into her, into her words. And she said, if I did three things, I could live. And I wanted to know, what are those three things, you know? And she said, attend all of your doctor's appointments. Take medication exactly as prescribed. Don't miss doses. And learn everything you can about this virus. Thank God that that other woman was there to give you accurate information. As unlucky as that first woman's words were, like it was like doubly lucky the second woman's. Exactly. She gave me pamphlets. I didn't even know they had case management. I didn't know there were organizations that, that people who were living with HIV could go to. I knew nothing. Even in my own city, I knew nothing. Because, you know, in the 90s, the early 90s, HIV was still that thing that people whispered about, even doctors. And she was somebody who gave me so much. I mean, we talk about how important representation is all the time, like seeing yourself in the media and on TV. And I think it's equally important to see yourself in life. You know, when you were going to these organizations, were you seeing, you know, other women, other women of color? It wasn't until I had my daughter and started going to the HIV outpatient clinic. And I remember the first time I walked in and it had like 10 women in the waiting room and I got angry. And I said, where were you? And this one girl looked up and she was like, what? <laughs> I said, where, where were y'all? Where were y'all when I needed to know this happens to women? And I vowed at that moment that if I ever got the courage and a microphone, that I would be that voice. Oh, because you're not in life. You're not just a person with HIV. You're also like an HIV professional now. I guess you listened to that woman when she said, find out everything you can about HIV. And you said, fine, I'll get a master's. Yes, yes. It's been an amazing journey. My health literacy is a lot higher than it was then. I remember I was living with my mom, sleeping in the room with my niece, and I used to lay under the covers at night with a flashlight and read these pamphlets. It were words I, did, I couldn't even pronounce. And I would write them down, and I said, when I go to the clinic, I'm asking Margo, what's this word? What does it mean? And I would do that. So were you gathering information back then like by like pamphlet by pamphlet? Yes. Yes. Everything that I, every time I would go to the clinic, they would have Paz Magazine. And I would read Paz Magazine. And then I found out about the body. And I found out that you can go to the body online. And people didn't have to know what you were doing. Just really wanting to know. Started out being very selfish. I wanted to know for me. And then I wanted to know for my community. I wanted to know for the women in the clinic who were sitting there every week or every three months when we would go to our patient clinic. And they would say, you know, I got a man. He don't know I have this. And we don't use condoms. Because a woman can't give it to a man. And I'd be like, oh, Lord. <laughs> be like, oh, Lord, that's not true. And we live in a state that criminalizes HIV. I want to stop there, actually, because I don't think that people actually know about criminalization laws for HIV. Can you explain about that? You're in Louisiana, right? Yes, I am in Louisiana. And we have a law in the books that says that if you, they call it intentional exposure. And even if I use a condom with somebody, if that, and what we call mad day, the day that the person gets mad with you, right? Y'all in a relationship. They may know your status. Y'all use condoms all the time, but that day when y'all break up, they can go to the DA and report you. The burden is on you, the person living with HIV. So now you can go to jail. Well, you, first of all, your name gets put in the paper. Is that part of the law? Yeah, they report it. The DA reports it. And that, I think they do it because they want other people to come forward and say that they had sex with you too. But they report it, and then you have, you're in the system. You can get up to 10 years for this. You know, and even with with all of the science we know, we've gone to legislators and told them about you equals you. Undetectable equals untransmittable. You cannot contract HIV from someone who's undetectable. You you reach undetectable status by being on effective HIV treatment. Everybody doesn't have the same access. Right. So that's two fights that I'm having at the same time. One to get you to understand that criminalization laws are B.S., and the other to say, 
We need equal access, even in rural areas, so people can reach undetectable status. And correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of these criminalization laws also map onto like the southern states in the U.S. where, you know, uh, the, the, there are higher rates of infection. Yes. A lot of the states had criminalization laws. That was one of the things that came about because of the Ryan White Care Act, the first one. Legislators felt like we can give them a free pass. And then, you know, there's always been this room of people who supposedly are out there just willy nilly throwing HIV in the air and hoping it rains down on everybody else, you know, because, you know, it's not just sex. If you spit at someone, if I'm in a fight with someone and I scratch them, or if I have on a piece of jewelry that, that scratches them, they can, they'll still, they can still arrest me for intentional exposure, even though we tell them, you know, it's not in saliva. Well, I often wonder what the disconnect is because I know very intelligent people who know how HIV is transmitted and they're still afraid to kiss somebody who has HIV. And to be clear, you cannot get it from kissing. And yet these are educated people who intellectually know that and yet still can't get past that. Like, like how, how do we get past something like that? I think all we can do is keep talking about it. I think because of the way HIV was introduced to society, right? It was introduced as this scary thing that no one know how you get it, but these guys were getting cancer and PCP pneumonia and, you know, just be careful. Keep bleach water in your house, you know, spray stuff down. It was all of this stuff and some of it kind of stuck with people over the years. So we just have to keep talking about it. We have to keep making sure we're educating people, educating our you about HIV. Is there a stigma differential across genders? How for like gay men, it's tied to like promiscuity? Like, is there like a stigma for like specifically for women? Yes. And the thing about it is, and, and we just had this conversation today, it's Wednesday, Monday. One girl was saying, and she's like, I, I say that I was promiscuous. And I said, well, promiscuity is a judgment statement. And she was like, huh? I said, yeah, it's a judgment statement. I said, now what I say is I've had multiple sex partners over the years. I said, but then I go a step further and I educate people and I say, you don't get HIV from multiple sex partners. You get HIV from one sex partner who was living with HIV. And because we don't have those conversations with our sex partners and because for women, I can remember, you know, I'm, I'm in recovery also. In August, it'll be 29 years I've been clean and sober. Even the life I was living, if, if I was with somebody and they said, and I said, use a condom. And they said, why, well, what's wrong with you? And I would say, nothing. And then I would let it go. Because even using a condom for a woman or introducing a condom into something for a woman can be stigmatizing. We still have people with toxic masculinity who thinks that if a woman carries condoms, she has to be some kind of, you know what? And it's like, that's not true. She's taking care of her body. Isn't that fascinating that in that example, it's always about like what the woman has to pass and not about the man? Yes. And when you were saying about um, criminalization and assault, also remember the South is the Bible Belt. We are morally bankrupt, but we have so many God doggone rules and morals. <laughs> and I think that's why the South sees more criminalization laws than other places. Because there is that being so moral that, you know, churches are talking about gay people and people, you know, gay, bisexual, and same gender loving men. They, oh, they never talk about the women as if women are not, you know, gay, bisexual, well, lesbian, bisexual, and same gender loving. We are too. But we don't talk about that in church. We only talk about the men and how it is an abomination and this, that, and the other. Then you have people in your church who's not going to tell you that they're living with HIV because you've already put a bad light on their lifestyle, you know, or who they are. You can get people to help you advocate for almost anything. That's one of the hardest things. Criminalization. I'm, I'm talking about lay people, just people in the community. Why do you think people should go to jail? <laughs> go to jail for having sex, you know? I mean, with everything we're talking about, I think, well, I mean, first of all, HIV is, you know, something that can remain private forever. You know, it doesn't have to be something that one shares. But like, why was it important for you to like come out and publicly speak about being a person living with HIV? I saw so many women dying. I saw so many women dying of shame. I saw so many women dying of guilt. I saw so many women paralyzed because of stigma. And I remember how that felt. You know, it was after Hurricane Katrina. I was in Dallas and I was ready to come home. I'd run across a lot of women I knew. And most, when they would hug me, they would whisper in my ear and they would say, don't say anything, don't nobody know. 
And then I would whisper in their ear, are you in care? And they would say no. And then I would tell them, you know, take my number, give me a call. And I'll tell them where they could go for care, things like that. I know that it's not as easy as connecting like one dot to this dot, but I cannot help but go back to what that first nurse told you. You have AIDS and you're going to die. And for so many women who hear that, they just say, okay, and they believe that. And so why would they get in care if they think they're going to die? And that was the case for a lot of women. You know, or if they came to the doctor, they only came while they were pregnant. And then they would deliver the baby and then they would fall out of care. I've had women tell me, you know, why take this medicine? Why take it? And I say, so that you can live, you know, so, but it makes you sick. I said, but it don't, the side effects only last a you know, certain amount of time, but you can live. But I'm going to die anyway. We're going to all die. You know, when I got ready to go to school, um, I told this one girl, I said, I want to go to college. And she kind of looked at me and she said, why? I was like, why not? You know, and she said, well, you're going to die. And I said, yes, we're all going to die. But I want to die with some letters behind my name. And I went to school. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, you got a bachelor's, graduated magnum cum laude, got a master's, and now you work at the Southern AIDS Coalition. Can you just describe your role and what you do there for everybody? Yes, I am the community engagement manager. I always say I'm the boots on the ground. I'm the person that's really immersed in community. So not only community of people living with HIV, but those impacted by HIV. We know that if we're going to end this epidemic, we can't just talk to people living with HIV. We have to talk to people outside of that. But not just HIV, all of the things, what we call social determinants of health. Right. So talking about poverty, talking about jobs, talking about housing, you know, real housing that we know that um, housing is not just health care, but it's also prevention. You know, if a, if a woman is unhoused and like we had storm last night, right, it's raining, you need a place to stay. And the man around the corner will give you and your kids a place to stay, but you got to sleep in his bed. And you're not the only one that sleeps in his bed. And you know this, but because he's giving you a place to stay, you may do that. That, that happens. So I talk to people about housing. We do two trainings in my department, LEAD Academy, which stands for Leadership, Education, and Advocacy Development, and Unity Workshop. LEAD Academy is for people who've been doing the work a little bit. Maybe their feet have gotten a little wet or they stuck a toe in the water and they like the way it feels and they want to do more. So we give them those skills. And that is my passion. My passion is to really give people not only more education in HIV, but more health literacy and policy of information. And I know you work with Compass, the initiative that specifically focuses on HIV in Southern states and working with local community groups. Is that through LEAD and that development work you do? Yes. Southern AIDS Coalition is a Compass Coordinating Center. And in my department under community engagement, yes, leadership, in, uh, leadership development is a part of our Compass work. Not only does it allow me to work with people living with HIV, but it also allows us to give money into communities that are doing work with HIV, right? And those grants can help change the lives of people living with HIV. Working with so many different people of varying backgrounds, I just think about like the stigma, we we just keep going back to it because it's so important. I just wonder if you can share like, you know, one or two of like the biggest stigmas that like need combating that you keep hearing repeated and repeated again? The biggest thing I think for people living with HIV, first of all, is our internalized stigma. It's all of that stuff we say to ourselves when we first get our diagnosis that sometimes live in our head for years. But we also have that externalized stigma, the stuff we hear in our community, right? Oh, this one still goes on in 2021. People go to their family member's house, sit down to have something to eat. And they give them a paper plate, throwaway fork, and a plastic cup. And everybody else has glass stuff. That still happens. I used to work at an organization. I went in the bathroom one day. I left out. I went back because I left something. And I smelled bleach as soon as I opened the door. One of the case managers was in there with a bottle of bleach, bleaching the bathroom. Wow. And I always would say to people, whenever they would tell me about family members or somebody doing that, I said, just let them know that the only thing they, they, you know, that lives on the toilet is crabs. HIV doesn't live on the toilet. Syphilis and gonorrhea doesn't live on the toilet. Just crabs. That's <laughs> Might get a bug or two, but that's all they're going to get. <laughs> and laugh about it because it is really sad that 
almost 40 years. You know, we're almost 40 years. And people still don't know. They still don't know. We have to do a better job in educating our youth. They're bearing the burden of this virus. And we have to do a better job in educating them. We have to make sure that when we're advocating to get rid of criminalization, HIV criminalization, that we're also advocating to include comprehensive sexuality education in our schools. Because kids need to get the facts and not, if you listen to your friends, they give you wrong information all the time. Get the facts. You made the decision to come out as a person living with HIV. And correct me if I'm wrong, but also you came out as bisexual just a couple years ago. Yes, I did. <laughs> In 2018, I came out. I've been with my girlfriend since 2013, though. Um, yeah, I made her, I, I made her keep it a secret <laughs> because there's stigma in that too in the black community, right? I already had kids. I was a mom. You don't, you know, and then people want to know, like, are you confused? Like, no, I've known this since I was 13. I just never acted on it, but it's been great. <laughs> or realizing that at 13 to keep it a secret for almost 40 years, that's a long time like keep that inside yes and I kept the secret because my cousin even before I could say anything about my feelings I told her I wanted to be a mechanic and she said if you become a mechanic people gonna call you a bull dagger and I didn't even know what that was I was like mm -mm, nope that's not gonna be me a month later I became sexually active a month later yep so nobody could ever say that about me I remember being in school and, you know, in junior high, that's when you first start changing your clothes for gym class. And I would make sure that I wouldn't look at anyone. I would not look at anyone. I would look at the wall because I didn't know, like HIV, I didn't know if people could look at you and tell. <laughs> and I was determined that that wasn't going to be me. But it's me. <laughs> I don't have any actual statistics in front of me, but I really don't think it's as uncommon as we make it out to be to come out later in life, in one's 40s and 50s. Yes. And so I really appreciate you talking about this today and for the whole conversation. So thank you so much for being here and doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that was Gina Brown. You can find out more about her and the work she does at the Southern AIDS Coalition at southernaidscoalition.org. And then as I mentioned, Sarah Schulman was here last week talking about the history of ACT UP and AIDS activism in the U.S. But I really wanted to focus not on the nostalgia side, but on the practical side, how to be effective and why this movement was effective and what we can learn from it today. Sarah is the author of the new book called Let the Record Show, and our interview with her is available in your podcast feed right now if you want to check it out. As always, if you enjoy our show, we greatly appreciate you helping us to spread the word. Send a tweet, post an Insta story, text or group chats. It's all the number one way you can help our show continue to grow. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I'll see you next week. Bye.